tonight, the major Supreme Court ruling blocking the Trump administration's effort to end DACA, the Obama-era program that's protected 800,000 young so-called dreamers from being deported. Speaking out exclusively, one of the officers charged after the death of Rayshard Brooks, his version of the fatal encounter, both officers surrendering to authorities, and the new video, Rayshard Brooks in his own words. Arizona, Florida setting new records for COVID cases. California reporting a spike, the governor's new order on wearing masks there. Inside the hospital COVID unit in New York, the one-time epicenter, how they're bracing for a possible second wave. New fallout from John Bolton's book, Bolton saying his old boss isn't fit for office. The president's furious reaction. And his controversial new comments about Juneteenth, what he said that's raising eyebrows ahead of his rally in Tulsa. His supporters lined up as health officials fear the event could become a super spreader for COVID. The massive lines, hundreds waiting hours for unemployment benefits, and the end of an era for an American political dynasty. This is NBC Nightly News with Lester Holt. Good evening, everyone. A stunning blow to President Trump today and a victory for undocumented immigrants known as Dreamers. The U.S. Supreme Court blocking the president from shutting down the program that has shielded hundreds of thousands of young people brought here as children from deportation. It's a second court ruling this week to be celebrated on the left and brought a sharp response from the president. Pete Williams has details. It's the second surprising ruling this week from a conservative Supreme Court, a big blow to President Trump, and a huge victory for young people in the DACA program. It was just an enormous relief to truly just, you know, shut down all of this confusion and, and worry, honestly. You can come out of the shadows. President Obama launched DACA, Deferred Action for Childhood Arrivals, in 2012 with the stroke of a pen by executive order. Since then, 800,000 young people known as Dreamers, brought to the U.S. by their undocumented parents, have been allowed to stay, go to school, and get jobs. President Trump could have shut it down the same way, by executive order. Instead, his Justice Department declared it illegal and the Department of Homeland Security ordered it ended. Today, by a vote of five to four, with Chief Justice John Roberts joining the court's four liberals, the court said that was too much of a shortcut. Roberts wrote the opinion saying the government failed to properly evaluate, as federal law requires, how ending DACA would affect those who relied on it to stay here and get jobs. In dissent, Justice Clarence Thomas called it an effort to avoid a politically controversial but legally correct decision. President Trump blasted the ruling, tweeting, These horrible and politically charged decisions coming out of the Supreme Court are shotgun blasts into the face of people that are proud to call themselves Republicans or conservatives. Among the strongest supporters of DACA, the medical community, relying on 27,000 people in the program to help fight COVID-19, like Javier Castro, a nurse in Houston. It just doesn't seem logical or fair to uh, take us out of circulation while we've been providing so much for this country since DACA was implemented. No word tonight on whether President Trump will try again to shut DACA down. If he did, that would undoubtedly lead to more court fights. Lester? Pete Williams tonight. Thank you, Pete. In Atlanta, the two police officers charged in the killing of Richard Brooks turned themselves in today, one of them speaking publicly and defending his actions. NBC's Blaine Alexander has late details for us. Tonight, the men charged in the death of Rayshard Brooks surrendering to officials, former Atlanta police officer Garrett Rolfe and officer Devin Brosnan. I have full faith in the criminal justice system. Brosnan charged with aggravated assault, breaking his silence with his attorney on MSNBC after posting bail. I think this is a tragic event and... Uh... It's totally a total tragedy that a man had to lose his life that night. Brosnan's line. lawyer denying that his client failed to provide and first aid and stood on well. Brooks' shoulders. It is preposterous and it is not true. And, it, and all you got to do is look at the video. An attorney for Rolf, charged with felony murder, says his actions were justified. I'm kind of getting tired of people saying that Mr. Brooks was running away. Mr. Brooks was not running away. Mr. Brooks turned and offered extreme violence towards a uniformed law enforcement officer. Around Atlanta, as the charges came down, some officers walking off the job in protest, others going radio silent, according to a union leader. We are not answering 911 calls right now due to personnel issues. Were those charges a breaking point for some officers? Oh, absolutely. And I would say not some, I would say the majority of the officers in the city of Atlanta. 
The Atlanta Police Department said they're experiencing a higher than usual number of call outs, but denied that multiple officers from each zone walked off the job, adding they are able to respond effectively to 911 calls. Last Friday, two of Officer Rolf's gunshots went into Brooks's back, a third hitting this SUV, according to the DA, the people inside visiting from Tennessee. We come to Atlanta to try to conquer our dreams, not witness no murders. And tonight, we are hearing from Brooks himself. In this newly released interview from February with the organization Reconnect, he talks about his previous run-ins with the criminal justice system. If, if you do some things that's wrong, you pay your debts to society, and that's the bottom line. The system could, you know, look at us as individuals. We do have lives, you know, we're, it's just a mistake we made, you know, and, you know, not, not just do us as if, we are animals. And the DA says because of the pandemic, they likely won't be able to convene a grand jury until October. Lester. All right, Blaine Alexander tonight, thank you. Troubling new signs this evening in the battle against COVID-19. The virus now exploding in Florida, Texas, and some other states as health officials grow more concerned about that Trump campaign rally two days from now in Oklahoma. Our Sam Brock has more tonight. Tonight, it's a tale of two regions. It's exciting because I know we all want to get back to, to regular life. New York finally getting the all clear to open up outdoor dining, retail and playgrounds. We've gone from the worst infection rate in the country to the best infection rate in the country. While a thousand miles to the south, the Sunshine State just barreled past its high water mark, confirming 3,200 new COVID cases in one day. I think there's more complacency and there's a higher risk of spread. I think that's what's happening in the south and the southwest Florida. Images of crowded restaurants and virtually no masks coming as new models pinpoint Florida as the nation's next large epicenter of transmission. Do you think it's premature for all these people to be going to bars and restaurants? No, not really. I think it was foolish. Obviously, the state's governor, Ron DeSantis, says no rollbacks are needed, attributing more testing to driving the spike. New York's governor now considering a 14-day quarantine on visiting Floridians as Miami-Dade hospitals, which have been stable, have seen 100 new COVID patients at a 17% jump in a week. The health care strain in Texas is more troubling, a 95% increase in COVID hospitalizations just since Memorial Day. In Ohio, new cases hit the highest mark in nearly a month. The governor there now redeploying the National Guard. While in California, Governor Gavin Newsom just issued a statewide mandate for masks in most indoor and outdoor settings. But amid signs of distress, a surge of something new, hope. The Mayo Clinic in Michigan State reviewed 20,000 plasma transfusions and have deemed them completely safe, allowing the focus now to shift to whether that same treatment can save lives. Sam Brock, NBC News, Miami. I'm Morgan Chesky in Tulsa, Oklahoma, where a spike in COVID-19 cases comes as crowds line up early for President Trump's first rally in months. I've wanted to come to one all my life. I'm 68 years old and here I am. Rosie Matlock will be camping in her chair till Saturday. One of the 20,000 supporters expected to pack BOK Arena. I'm as concerned about the virus as I am about every yearly flu. But new numbers show a 100% spike in Tulsa cases in just the past week. A stat commissioner, Karen Keith, says is about to get worse. If you had President Trump in front of you right now, what do you tell him? I would beg him as our national leader to call this off. The president's campaign promising temperature checks and masks, but no requirement just yet to actually wear them. And we're taking care of them, and we know what the high risk means, but uh, largely it means older people, especially older people, senior citizens. I am concerned. I, I really am. But I really wanted to see this man speak. And tonight, due to that spike in cases, the BOK Center has now formally requested the Trump campaign provide a plan on how to socially distance come Saturday. Lester. Morgan Chesky, thank you. As New York City prepares to begin the next phase of its reopening, tonight we have a rare and a powerful look inside one of the COVID units that battled the virus at the epicenter. Our Gabe Gutierrez tonight on lessons learned for the potential next wave. Inside Lenox Hill Hospital in Manhattan, the fight against the coronavirus has changed drastically. One month ago on this unit, 
um, alarm bells everywhere. Dr. Nazish Ilyas and her colleagues are still treating COVID-19 patients, but much less frequently. Right now, this is the hospital's only COVID unit. At one point at the height of the pandemic, it had about 20 and it was dealing with more than 300 patients across the hospital. On this day, just six. But they're now preparing for a potential second wave later this year, coinciding with flu season. They now know they can triple their number of ICU beds. On-site testing has improved, but there's still a shortage of reagents, the chemicals needed to conduct the tests, which are often made overseas. As America reopens. We just have to be ready. People are socially distancing still, um, you know, hand hygiene. You can't completely control this disease despite all the preventative measures, but I think it definitely helps. At the pandemic's peak, a quarter of the patients here were critically ill. A makeshift morgue set up outside. Dr. Ilias herself got sick. I never thought we would end up being the epicenter of the world. Everyone here remembers March 7th, the first COVID patient. The next few weeks were a blur of long shifts and longer nights. Did you ever think it would get as bad as it did? No. Dr. Linda Kirchenbaum is an experienced critical care physician. Even for her, the onslaught was shocking. Seeing a husband and wife uh, die together uh, of COVID in the same room um, uh, of the same disease, I've never seen that in my, in my career. Dr. Jill Coleman is the hospital's executive director. It was on her to make sure there were enough ventilators, enough beds, enough protective equipment. As patients were coming in rapidly and dying rapidly, Every night when we were just thought we weren't ahead of it, when we might not have PP, we might not have vents, those were the moments where you said, is everybody going to be okay? That's a stress. <laughs> this emergency room was transformed into a COVID unit almost overnight. It's now back to normal. But for nurses like Marina De Maria, the emotional scars are fresh. I can't tell you how many times I went home and cried and, and thought about all the things I could have, should have, would have done. Um, you know, and ultimately we did everything we could do, every single one of us. Every night at 7 o'clock, she cherishes the New Yorkers who still cheer frontline workers. It's overwhelming. You know, when we were in it, it was just about getting through it and helping as many people as we can. It was something I've never seen before. Uh, it's something I hope I never see again. Here they won the battle. The war may not be over. Gabe Gutierrez, NBC News, New York. Some of the real heroes among us. Lies, made up stories, ridiculous statements, just some of the things President Trump had to say today about the new bombshell book by John Bolton, his former national security advisor. Peter Alexander has more now from the White House. President Trump tonight firing back at John Bolton, blasting his new book as made up lies and fake stories that he said all good about me in print until the day I fired him. A disgruntled, boring fool. It comes as Bolton, who says he resigned, delivers more stinging accusations about his former boss. I don't think he's fit for office. I, I don't think he has the competence to carry out the job. There really isn't any guiding principle uh, that I was able to discern other than uh, what's good for Donald Trump's reelection. Bolden writes President Trump was so focused on a trade deal with China, which he hoped could help his reelection, that he told President Xi he'd support China's controversial prison camps for minority Muslims. The president denies it, and so does another top aide. Absolutely untrue. Never happened. I was there. Bolton also says President Trump told him directly that he wanted to withhold security aid to Ukraine until all the Russia materials related to Clinton and Biden had been turned over. That was the central argument in House Democrats' impeachment case, but Bolton refused to testify without a subpoena and in his book blames Democrats for not expanding their investigation beyond Ukraine. This is called a con. It's really a sad thing because he knew that the president should be removed from office. That's clear. Also tonight, President Trump making his most extensive comments about racism in America since George Floyd's death. Telling the Wall Street Journal, I would like to think there is not such systemic racism. Unfortunately, in the real world, there is some. Whatever I could do to reduce that or get rid of it, I'd be very happy with. Adding, I would also say it's very substantially less than it used to be. And on the return of his campaign rallies this Saturday in Oklahoma that the president pushed back after criticism, he scheduled it for Juneteenth, the day commemorating the end of slavery. 
President Trump now says, I did something good. I made Juneteenth very famous. It's actually an important event. It's an important time. But nobody had heard of it. Late tonight, according to the Washington Post, an African-American senior State Department official, Mary Elizabeth Taylor, resigned over the president's handling of racial tensions, saying his actions go against her core values. Lester? Peter Alexander at the White House tonight. Thank you, Peter. A dire new report on unemployment today. Another 1.5 million Americans filing jobless claims last week, showing that even as some return to work, employers are still laying people off. Here's Jolene Kent with that. For three days, scores of unemployed workers in Kentucky have been lining up. Do not lose your ticket. Desperate for help. I got through to nobody since I filed in April the 19th. Out of work and out of patience, Kentucky residents poured into the Capitol for their first chance to get an in-person meeting at a pop-up unemployment office since the pandemic began. Brianna Glass applied three months ago and is still having trouble getting payments. She stood in line yesterday just days after giving birth. I mean, I've called, I've emailed, I've did everything I possibly could and still nothing. A similar scene in Alabama, some even camping out overnight. The National Guard deployed in Washington state to help investigate fraud. Nearly 46 million jobless claims have been filed in the last three months, including one and a half million last week. While claims are ticking down as states reopen, they've stayed in the millions for 13 weeks. Assigned layoffs aren't stopping. Fed Chair Jerome Powell urging Congress to extend the $600 a week of extra federal unemployment aid provided by the CARES Act, which ends on July 31st. Back in Kentucky, Kayla Williams, who applied more than two months ago, feels frustrated and abandoned. When are you going to help us? We are your people. Jolene Kent, NBC News. In 60 seconds, celebrating Juneteenth by honoring the rich culinary history of African Americans that goes back to slavery. We're just a few hours away now from Juneteenth, a holiday taking on new importance amid the growing demands for racial justice, a celebration of freedom, family, and food. Here's Morgan Radford. In Charlotte, North Carolina, it's back to business for Greg and Sabrina Collier. The couple recently reopened their restaurant, Leah and Louise, serving Southern cuisine. We try to look at the menu and try to curate something that is very intentional, that's rooted in blackness, but something that everybody can understand. For Juneteenth, they're serving Memphis-style pork ribs and potato salad. Greg and I want to use this Juneteenth to say that's Freedom Day. We're still fighting. So we want to say, look, this is who we are. This is where we're from. Juneteenth recognizes the day enslaved black people were finally freed. During slavery, they preserved African tradition by cooking with what they had available. The foods of enslaved black people are some of the bedrocks of so-called soul food. From his kitchen in Harlem, Donovan Woodley runs The Weekender, a meal service delivering gourmet soul food. You're making each plate and cooking it and then in the middle of a pandemic, serving it. Yeah, bringing in the type of food that I make, I think it's a good service to the people around me to feel the things that they felt growing up. A reminder of a history that he says is often overlooked. We were the first chefs of America from when we were enslaved, from us making foods from scrap and creating it into something that can be uh, table worthy, is that, that's a feat of its own. Black chefs have historically been underrepresented in the food industry. Last year, only 14% of chefs and head cooks were black. The uh, time has come, it is long past time for the food of the African diaspora to be celebrated, to appear and to be acknowledged. For Woodley, his Juneteenth takeout brunch is a necessary reminder. That process of feeling joy around people that unfortunately during this quarantine time we haven't gotten a whole bunch of, right? A joy rooted in history and fellowship. Morgan Radford, NBC News, New York. Up next, the end of an era. Jean Kennedy Smith, last surviving sibling of JFK, has died. Andrea Mitchell reports on her life and legacy in the end of an era. She was the youngest daughter of Rose and Joseph Kennedy, the eighth of nine children, and in a rowdy, athletic family raised to be tough. You should be thinking all the time about what you can do for this country. No whining in this house, so that was very strict. A matchmaker, she introduced her brothers to her friends, Jackie to Jack, 
Ethel to Bobby, Joan, his first wife, to Teddy. She married Stephen Smith in 1956 and had four children, hitting the campaign trail for Jack in 1960. She was a surprising but popular choice to be President Clinton's ambassador to Ireland, ruffling diplomatic feathers by traveling to Northern Ireland and persuading Clinton to let Jerry Adams, the head of the IRA's political arm, come to the U.S., laying the groundwork for the historic peace with Northern Ireland years later. The last of her siblings, Jean Kennedy Smith, received the Medal of Freedom from President Obama in 2011. She was 92. Andrea Mitchell, NBC News. We'll be right back. In our latest installment of Nightly News Kids Edition, we take a look at the meaning behind Juneteenth. Plus, we salute the class of 2020. And here's some advice kids have for the next class. Have fun, be nice, and work hard. You got that right, little man. Our new episode is streaming right now. That's Nightly News. I'm Lester Holt. Please take care of yourself and each other. Good night. Hey, NBC News viewers, thanks for checking out our YouTube channel. Subscribe by clicking on that button down here and click on any of the videos over here to watch the latest interviews, show highlights and digital exclusives. Thanks for watching.